This episode is brought to you by 1923 on Paramount+. Plus. In Taylor Sheridan's new original series, 1923, the Duttons confront challenges, including the end of the First World War, America's industrialization, and the start of the Great Depression. Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford star in the new original series, 1923, streaming December 18th exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to A Visit to the Mound. I'm Lark Smith, along with Stan Huff. And I'm here because I've spent 40 years broadcasting baseball at several levels, from Little League to high school to college. Never been in the pros, but hey, that's the way it goes. Uh, but I'm also a 13-year student of the game of baseball. Stan's here because he's got like 35 years of experience in baseball. Tell us a little bit about that, Stan. Well, I was drafted by the Mets in 74, 1974, and uh, I played in their organization for a number of years and got traded over to Astros uh, in 1981. And from there, after playing there, I started coaching with the Astros and went to, from Astros to the uh, Texas Rangers to the uh, New York Yankees, the New York Yankees, Montreal Expos, and Baltimore Orioles. So along the way, I learned a lot. I got a lot of a lot of good information. And I used it too, so it helped me particularly in the managing side. So uh, that's it. But my baseball career, I was a catcher. Uh, actually, got drafted as an outfielder, but. Saw what was going on with the outfielders. I thought I had a better shot with catching. So maybe it was a good decision, maybe not. But anyway, I don't have any regrets. But it's that <clears> 35 <throat> years of experience that you want to maybe pass along to folks that are listening to this podcast as to any number of instructional things, some stories that you have, and just some baseball knowledge in general. Right. There is a, a lot of, a lot of uh, f- parents that I do lessons with their sons have asked me, you know, I'd like to uh, volunteer to work, but I don't really know how to, how to coach a team or what to do there. So, you know, I was just, just one of the ideas I had was to, uh, you know, probably explain this over the, uh, the airwaves and, and you know, get it to everybody as soon as possible. And, and maybe those options that they have there, they could use on their own. So, an amateur coach, the first thing he has to do is pick a team, right? Well, you got to pick a team. Yeah, the best the best way to go about that is to try to get the best ball player, and starting with pitching, and then you need a, a good catcher, and the second base, the shortstop, and a good center fielder, or, or or you try to do that. You know, a lot of times it's a luck of the draw, but anyway, if you can do it that way, you're going to have strong a stronger team up the middle, in which most of the game is played in in the middle of the field. So. You know, once the uh, once you get the the team set up, then it's it's time for uh, you have a parents meeting. You know, lay down kind of a you know not really stringent rules, but uh, you know this is where we're going to do things and allow us to do this. So, uh, pardon, after, pardon my interruption, but sure. I could have sworn that the first priority was pick the the GLMs, the good looking moms. Oh well, yeah, I forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully their kid can play a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's a good. That, that's good, Mark. Uh, but anyway, well, let's move on here. Uh, you know, you get into the the situation where you know you're going to have your first practice. You got your team set up. You told everybody when it's going to be and and what you're going to do. And and you get out there the first day. You need to have a, a just a preliminary meeting with your players, and you set real easy rules down like one or two of them and those one or two rules are hustle you, there you don't have to be good to hustle and be on time those are the best rules that you can do and and try not make sure i understand that you, if you're not going to be here beforehand and not when i'm looking for you at, at the practice once that's laid out what you want to try to do is uh uh, you you go over everything you you know you this with the, like we had the short meeting. Then you want to do f- uh, flexibility and stretching. That's important even at little league level. You know they got to get the idea that they have to be in some kind of a, a shape to to play. So you want to go through uh, you want to go through a, a flexibility and stretching exercise, and and usually that yeah about ten minutes. And most coaches think that a stretching exercise is just warming up. 
no. throwing baseballs. That's yeah. what most coaches start a practice with, just you know, get out there and warm up. But you say no. you need to do some stretching before. Actually, that you said warm up. So I, I would uh, before we start stretching, I'd jog them, make them jog to the center field fence and back. Okay. You know, just to get the get the blood pumping a little bit, and then do the flexibility stuff and the exercises, and that should last about ten minutes. And then it's time to pair up and play catch along the same, not one group being one way and the other group being another way because an overthrown ball is going to get somebody hit. So everybody lines up probably around along the foul line. They throw to the outfield and outfield. Uh, the guys in the outfield throw back to them and all together. So that should last roughly about eight minutes. <clears throat> and uh, once you get loose, once you get a, got your arm loose and warm, ready to go, you want to line them up and let's do some sprints. That we, and we don't start off at the, at the hard, as you, hard as you can go. You start off like, like from, tolerable. Like from first to second base? I would go from – I'd have a, I'd I'd go from the outfield foul line because okay. you can line everybody up at one time and and have them all run at one time. You can't foul line to foul line. No, I would uh, put somebody about thirty forty yards off the foul line into the outfield and run to that person and walk back. Okay, and they do about oh, ten to twelve of those. All right, that get that gets your legs warm and ready to go for everything you're going to do next. Now. Depending on what kind of uh, what kind of uh, equipment you got on the field, ultimately, if the best way to do it is to have a have a a mobile batting cage that you can pull up to the to the uh, plate and have a pitching screen out there, and then have screens around first, second, or third where you can hit ground balls during the infield during batting practice and get everybody work at one time, but. I know there's a lot of places you can't do that. So what we need to do then is to just have the infielders get all together in one place and hit ground balls to them because they do have to work on catching or fielding a ground ball from the ground up. Okay, and the more you can do this, the better they're going to get. Okay, and then you'll have somebody in the outfield, like a coach in the outfield, hitting fly balls or trying to hit fly balls to the (laughs) to the outfielders i've seen the, some of those guys it's really a tough it's it's a work they, they need to practice that to <laughs> sweet strike three and he just threw it up to hit it uh anyway well we get that done and that should uh you know about 15 minutes okay so the next thing you want to do is a fundamental now those fundamentals can be done like not all at one time but you pick one for that day like a pickoff or a rundown, uh, work on bunt defenses another day, then work off work on cutoffs and relays. Okay, then then if you got a uh, elevated uh, players like teens or something, you want to you know work on leads, taking their leads and and getting a jump to steal second base. Um, now one thing else that's really important is you need to uh, have time to do pitchers feeling practice PFP. That's where you're hitting ground balls back to the pitchers, and, and they're throwing either to first base or coming up to turn a double play, throwing to second, then to first, and it working on those bunt defenses with the pitchers out there as well. Um, outfield practice, uh, they need to work on hitting the cutoff, man. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in all at levels of baseball. Those outfielders want to show those arms off, but they're throwing rainbows to the bases, and unless they've got a plus arm, you know, that's that's going to just – the base runners are going to take extra bases because the ball's in the air so long. That or it's overthrown. <laughs> or it's overthrown, yeah. I've seen them thrown out of the ballpark, to yeah. be honest with you. So it, it, that I've, d- will, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the cutoff, man, Lark, will you? Anyway, uh, that's what you're going to do. Now, if your team's younger, teach the positions – infield let's teach them how to catch to receive or or catch a ball from the waist up from, excuse me from, from the waist ground. up from the ground up uh from the ground up is a lot quicker than going with their their glove at the their belly and and jabbing down at the ball so uh you want to work on that ground up for catching the ground balls and for the outfielders they need to learn how to uh play back or come in work on stuff like that 
and particularly on fly balls when they got to catch a ball running to to make a throw to a, to a, to a base. Uh, once again, emphasizing hitting the cutoff man. Um, now, after you do that, that's going to last about 30 minutes, okay? Well, the next thing we need to do is go into batting practice. And this is one of the problems I've seen on most of these uh, amateur little league, teenage leagues, they don't hit every day. They need to hit every day. Every time there's a practice, they need to be hitting. And when they're not at practice, they need to be working on that on their own with a tee in the backyard with a screen or a net and hitting balls and working on their swing. Uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of guys say, you know, well, it's not hitting. Well, when you're only working on hitting maybe 20, 20 minutes a week, you're not going to be much of a hitter. You got That's one of those things that if you're going to be a sprinter, you got to run sprints every day. Well, if you're going to be a hitter, you need to really hit every day if you can in some form or fashion. So we're going to have batting practice. Now that batting practice is uh, – is probably going to last anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and 45 minutes, okay? And what you do is you split your team up into, into uh, hopefully, even groups, and you'll have one group of, uh, like infielders. You'll have them uh, taking ground balls, if they're not in that group, off the bat during the batting practice. Outfielders will be taking fly balls off the bat during that part. That's, that's how they can work uh, on their – craft out there now <clears throat> also it, you've got to have uh, another coach on the side with a catcher and a pitcher and you have a pitcher throwing throwing a bullpen on the side now uh, once they're loose five to ten minutes and that's about it uh, that that should help out so if everything is done like it should be done your batting practice is probably just going to last around two and a half hours your full practice, you mean? The full practice. Now, I've seen four- and five-hour practices where I, where really and truly nothing got done, and that that tends to drive the kids away because they're bored. You know, not much movement out there, but when you, when you got them actively working in batting practice, working on their craft, or actually at the batting cage hitting, now while you got the, the guys waiting to go, you could have them hitting off a tee – that group that's hitting, the other guys can be hitting off a tee into a net if you got it. And then they get they come up. They're, that way they're getting extra extra, extra swings uh, for their, you know, in their batting practice. Seven or eight swings is not enough. You need to, you need to do 15 to 15, 10 to 15, let's say 10 to 15 swings and do about three rounds of that and then get the next group in. If you can do that, you're going to have better better hitters walking up to the plate. Even guys that even uh, even guys you didn't think were going to be all right because you don't know what is actually burning in that belly. Is this batting? Excuse, excuse me. Is this batting practice off of a machine or off a live arm? Hopefully, it's off a live arm. The those wheel machines aren't good really, and the reason why they're not good is uh, because you can't time a, a machine. You can time a live arm. All the it, it's like in the game you got the pitcher and the hitter. It's like that they're dance partners. Something the pitcher does, the hitter is going to do something. Okay, so once that arm goes back, the the hitter is going to start loading up. Once the ball's in the air, he's going to stride forward to a balanced position, and then he's going to hit the ball as it as it comes over the plate. Hopefully, so so it's. It, there's a lot of timing and rhythm involved in that, and that's why you need a live arm throwing that batting practice. If you got, if you don't have a live arm, okay, you use the pitching machine, but that would be, that would be a stopgap. That's not the primary, you know. And if guys want to throw batting practice, I would hopefully, I would hope that they uh, they work on that before they start practice, so they can throw good pitches to the hitters. Okay, that's another thing. When you're not throwing strikes, everybody's. Uh, well, standing around doing nothing. Yeah, exactly. So that that happens again. Um, that's a good question you asked. Uh, definitely. In spring training, we didn't use those wheel machines f to hit off of. We used them for ground balls. Yeah, fly and balls. we used them fly balls Pops too. Ups. 
And what we did use, though, was those iron mics, you mm-hmm. know, where you saw the, the the arm come. You could time that arm coming around, and you could follow it. And mm-hmm. that, that helps with the timing rhythm, particularly when you don't have a, a guy that can throw uh, 500 pitches a day. Well, there have been times and uh, it, recently and for a long time that I've thrown anywhere from 400 to 800 pitches a day because these kids needed – needed to swing the bat off of a live arm to get their timing and rhythm right. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> what you've described is a practice that's going to last two, two and a half hours? Yeah. Uh, and you could get a lot done if, you, if, if it works that way. I and, mean, if you're scheduled it out and it's regimented like that, you're going to be fine. And, you know, the parents are going to like it too because you're not keeping their kid out all night. You know, Particularly the moms, they they usually go back home and do something, come back and your free two hour babysitter. <laughs> exactly, and we don't want to be that. We want to help them and make them help them get better. That's all. Okay. All right, that's what we've done for the instruction part today. Let's talk about what's going on in baseball today. <laughs> okay. Now, it seems to me that there's plenty of talk right now about umpires and how they are supposed to be infallible. I mean, shortstops make errors. Pitchers throw wild pitches. Catchers have pass balls. Why can't an umpire miss a pitch every now and then? Because they're not supposed to. (laughs) No, you're right. They're human, too. They make mistakes. I've been, well, i got to admit, and I regret this part, too. I've been harder on umpires than, than I've been on my players. But, you know, one thing I didn't like, one thing, I, I did tell some umpires. I said, "I expect you to hustle." Oh yeah, now that right. part, yeah, I'll go, I'll get on them for not hustling. Well, and I'll talk to them about rules. But it, it comes to balls and strikes, fair, foul, out, safe. Hey, they got to make a call. The way it goes, yeah. But you know, uh, as far as uh, hustling goes, I get on my players when they're not hustling, and I'm not gonna take. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to short the, the umpires either. I said, get off your butt and let's go, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, yeah, I got to give them credit. It's a thankless job, but somebody's got to do it. And, and Most of the guys that I've seen do it did a pretty good job. Well, in watching college games over the last few years and hearing people hollering from the stands, I'm just thinking, you know, why do we pay umpires when we've got 14 in the stands ready to call the game? Just let the guys in the stands call the game. Well, what I t- I could tell you this at one teenage league game, the 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 guy that was running the league had enough of it. These moms, he had the moms get out there and call the games, and they did it. And it was uh, matter of fact, it was a sideshow at the circus at best, <laughs> but it was fun to watch. And they found out what it's like being yelled at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> glamorous, thankless job. Oh brother, yeah. but yeah. they get they get paid. Some of them get paid handsomely to do it. The higher they go, they do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, you know, you're living out of a of a car. It, you it's usually in the lower minors. It's two man, and they they're traveling together, and they really never have an off day unless there's a rain out or a scheduled off day or. It's a travel day for them, mm-hmm. and that usually they're traveling, and, you know, they come in late, get into a hotel, got to be at the ballpark the next day and ready to go. Man, they Okay, this is another thing the umpires have to do. They have to rub up six to seven dozen Doesn't baseballs before the games. Okay, think about that. That is a lot of baseballs to do, so they got to get there early, and it's part of their job. Mm-hmm. One other thing we want to talk about is some of the characters you've run across throughout your career. And one of those, you had a chance at the independent league level to coach Max Shearzer. Yeah, Max was, uh, he was with us in 2007 at uh, Fort Worth. And uh, he came out of the University of Missouri, I believe. He did. And uh, why was he there at an independent league? Okay, so his agent, uh, it's my understanding that what was offered to him wasn't at, during the draft wasn't what they came back with. Okay, the, what was offered before the draft was not what they came up with after the draft. So since he had already committed to an agent and all that and the rules in baseball, this is, well, you now you cannot go back to college. 
I don't know where he was as far as uh, eligibility, though, but you had lost it once you had done that. So they we made a, a deal with his agent and brought him to Fort Worth, and we got him four or five, I think five starts. I could be wrong on that. Uh, and we told the agent that we were going to treat it just like, you know, they were in minor, the big league camp uh, or, or professional baseball. We're going limit to limit his pitch count. And whether good or bad, he's coming out after that because we want to protect that. This isn't his his uh, only stop. It's just his first stop is where he's p- pitching professionally. And uh, he did very well. He did did very well. And at every game, there was at least 30, 35 scouts at every game, which was a benefit to the other players. I said, you got all these scouts in the stands. Why don't you do something to help yourself get into – uh, affiliated baseball or get back into it you gotta you're on the stage as well as max is so you know i told him that and max did a good job <clears throat> and it paid off business wise it paid off better for him so that what he was offered he got twice that after uh after he pitched for us we got drafted i believe it was by the arizona diamondbacks i'm not sure but uh and he's gone on and won a couple uh, Cy Youngs now. So he's a very intense guy, very intense ball player. I, well, I'll tell you one story. This isn't the only story, though. I'm sure. <laughs> we were in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was asking the catcher, uh, you know, where's that pitch? Well, the umpire thought I was talking to him. He threw me out of the ball game. Awesome. Well, I wanted to go – Tell him about this. Uh, look, I was asking the catcher, what, what's up here? Well, I heard somebody behind me as I was going out to the umpires to talk to the umpire. I looked around, it's Max. I said, Max, go ahead and sit back down in the dugout. I, this isn't my first time doing this, so I, I don't need the help. <laughs> I appreciate your, your wanting to help, but I need you in the ball game to pitch. This is what you need to do. So he went and sat down, and, uh, of course, I went and, I said, well, you know, whatever. I had my say with the guy, and I left. But uh, I thought that was interesting. I never had a player help want to help me out <laughs> with umpire <laughs> discussion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he's a very intense guy. He's he's focused uh, to almost over the top focused, and you know, it's look that kind of focus has paid off well for him. That'll wrap up this visit to the mound. We certainly appreciate you joining us today for a little baseball talk. Anytime you want to hear something about baseball, you can find us anywhere you get your podcast, or you can go to roguemedianetwork.com for the next edition of A Visit to the Mound.